All the Matthew chapter 8, we finished last week, obviously, and we saw how, you know, Jesus was revealing publicly his power and authority over the, the natural world, all the things that remain tangible to us. You know, and, and I, I think when I started the chapter two, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, whatever it was, I, I, I mentioned how one of my most frust- greatest frustrations in my relationship with the Lord is that he's sort of intangible. You know, I pray, I talk to him. And I see the marks of my relationship with him, how he provides so faithfully and even sometimes so amazingly. This church is, to me, an evidence of God. I can't even believe that we exist as a fellowship. It's just an awesome thing. I think it's a miracle. It's amazing. And that's because I know me. You don't know me. But I know me, and I think this is a miracle. But see, I, I believe in Jesus, and I pray to him, and I talk to him. But there's just this intangibility. And sometimes, you know, and this is, you know, maybe not as much of a masculine trait, but, but don't question my manhood because I'll get offended. No, I'm kidding. But sometimes, don't you just want to touch the one you love? Don't you just want to give him a hug or go for a walk? And isn't, you miss that. That's what we do. We don't have that with God. And, and, and so the Lord Jesus, he knew that we would feel that way. He knew that this would be difficult for us. But what he made sure we knew in these pages here in chapter 8 and even here in chapter 9 as we're going to see, he made sure and wanted to make sure that we knew that the things that are tangible to us in our everyday life, he has absolute power and authority over those things. And so while we can't sit down with him, we can't, sit, we can't go for a walk and talk with him, he can't tap us on the shoulder and, and, and say, I, got, I, want you to, I want to deal with this and you, you know, I want to confront you with your sin. And I would love that. I'd love those things. It would be great. But we don't have that now. And so he reveals to us, don't worry about it. The things that you're going to struggle with, the things that you're going to struggle with in this life of yours, I have power over all of them. They all bow to me, Jesus says. And, and specifically, the most important one that we see here, and every one of these things that he has power over are all, pretty much all of them are a consequence or as a result of sin. The Adamic nature. When you and I, were, when we were born, we inherited this sin nature. You know, it's, you're like, but that's not my fault. I was, you're saying I was born a sinner? You were born a sinner, you know? I love how babies, you know, they just look so cute and everyone's like, oh, look at the little baby when it's born. I know Chris and Melissa got little Matthew and all the little babies in the church. And, you know, but I did hear a story one time of, uh, you know, one of the Bible teachers out at the Bible college. He said, in reality, we ought to walk up and go, oh, you little sinner. Hi. He's such a little sinner. You're so cute. But that's the truth. I mean, it's the reality. We inherit that when we're born. And, and yet, it, and it's, a, it's such a bondage. And without Jesus, we're stuck in that for eternity. Jesus has power over all these things. Most importantly, Jesus has power over sin. Jesus has power over sin. And if it weren't for Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, there would be no disease. There would be no real concern for us with the spiritual realm in terms of demonology and those kinds of things. We wouldn't really have to worry about it if we were walking with the Lord. In fact, if you look at the way you know, the manifestation of the demonic realm during the time of Adam and Eve, you know, Satan took on the appearance of a certain, there was, he was very tangible. He, you could see him. The spiritual realm was very, you know, visible. And that's because of this little thing we call the inversion uh, of, of humanity, where we used to be spirit, soul, and body before sin, Adam and Eve. Now we're body, soul, and spirit. And that's, that's the trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit of mankind. We're made up of three things, just like God, the Godhead is. And the inversion of the trichotomy, now the body rules and the spiritual realm is almost difficult, for, is very difficult for us to discern. You know, we go on with these things and we look at, gosh, he has power over sin. He has power over disease. He has power over demons. He has power over all mankind. And we deal with, you know, men and women and and we treat each other poorly. And God has power over that. You're not powerless in the relationships that you have on earth, by the way. You're not powerless. You you can pray. You, You have a, this same Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. You have trouble with relationships in this world? Jesus is wanting to intercede for that. And, and if it weren't for this Adamic nature, this sin nature that we've inherited, the natural realm or the natural world, the tangible world would behave itself. There wouldn't be this animosity where animals are afraid of us and, you know, there's all that we're afraid of each other and, and all this other stuff. It wouldn't be that way. So we saw last week and the week before how we saw these things. We saw disease and Verses 1 through 15. We saw demonic forces in 16 and 17 and 28 and 34. We saw, you know, uh, men that, that Jesus needed to have power over in 18 through 22. We saw nature itself as Jesus calmed, you know, the, 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 the storm in verses 23 through 27. 
Now, now, we're seeing miracles, Jesus revealing these things to us, showing us why we ought to have confidence and faith and trust in Him because of His ability to, con to, to control the natural realm, and He does it through a little device we call miracles. That's the word, you know, we use to identify any time He exercises His authority within the natural realm using His supernatural power. We call them miracles. Now, there's reasons for miracles, there's, and I just wrote down a few of them just to help us keep miracles in their category, because we often wonder, a, why don't we see more of them now? That would be a, probably the most common question. Why don't we see more, more miracles now, right? And you hear stories, oh, the mission field, this, that. There are many miracles, I think, all around us. But primarily, I'm going to give you these three reasons, and I'll back them up a little bit with some scripture. I'm, this isn't exhaustive. There are probably more that you can come up with. Reason number one, evidence to his identity. Evidence to his identity. See, Jesus wanted to make sure that we knew he is who he says he was. And you remember there in uh, John chapter 14, verse 11, when Philip was doubting, he, or Philip was questioning, Jesus said this. He said, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. See, what he's saying is, look, if, if you're not sure who I am, you're not, you don't have absolute confidence in my messianic identity, in my deity, you know, and you, you, you ought to just, just examine the works. Look at the miracles I've done. You ought to be able to find some evidence that I am who I say I am based on the things I've done. Powerful. Evidence to his identity, one of the primary reasons for his miracles. Well, how, do, how does that connect, in a sense, to the Old Testament, and how does that, you know, prove that he is who he says he was? Well, it's to fulfill all prophecy. Reason number two, the second reason to fulfill all prophecy. See, the reason we know that God should have the ability to do miracles is because in the Old Testament it was prophesied that the Messiah would have the ability to do this. Look at Isaiah 35. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Isaiah 35, uh, verses 5 and 6 says this. Then, speaking prophetically, futuristically, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, and then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing. Do you know every one of these things mentioned here, Jesus does in Matthew, most of them right here in chapters 8 and 9. All fulfilled right here. The fulfillment of prophecy. See, the prophets said some things about the Messiah that would happen as a result of him. Jesus needed to fill those things. Otherwise, he wouldn't be the Messiah because the Word of God needs to remain intact, right? And this third thing I'll mention, just because... Um, it's an important look into the heart of Jesus and the character of Jesus. I don't even need to back it up with a Bible verse, but you see, Jesus have, has a particular affinity for broken people. We're going to see that in chapter 9 quite a bit. Jesus has a particular affinity for broken people. If you're hurting, you're broken, you're, you're struggling with, you know, sickness, disease, sin, Jesus, you know, he's right there. He just is desperately waiting for you to turn to him. Amen? Let's look at verse 1. Well, that was a long way around the barn to get to verse 1, wasn't it? I apologize for that. The power and the authority of the king is revealed here in Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Jesus got into a boat, and he crossed over, and he came to his own city. Now, you remember last week when we left him, he had gone over to the area of uh, Gargesera, or whatever the name of the town was, where the Gergesenes and uh, you know, the other neighboring regions lived. And that was a mixed culture over there. There were both Jews and Gentiles, but very paganistic. And you remember that's where he cast the demons out of the, out of the pig herders, right? The swine herders. And, and uh, they were, you know, cast, and then they jumped into the sea. And then the people of, uh, of, the, of the town really came out, and they didn't, they didn't like him being there. They were afraid of Jesus. And, and fear, you guys, is the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. Somewhere in there, there's probably some fear, something that you're afraid of. What's he going to take away from me? And that's really the perspective of the Gergesenes. He took away their, their, pig, their pig ranch. <laughs> no more pig ranch. Our business is gone. No more bacon. I'm afraid of not having bacon, therefore I reject Jesus. Something like that. But what are we afraid of when, when it comes to going further with the Lord? Why do, what do we... Why do we sometimes keep the Lord at arm's length? No longer would Nazareth be his home. That's the past because they rejected him, you might remember. And, and now he's come to take up residence in an area we call Capernaum. And this is where he's heading, heading back to, back across the sea. And, you know, here in Capernaum, 
Jesus set up camp, if you will, because this is where they, they would begin to receive his teachings and, and receive these miracles that he did. And, and then, you know, he would gather his disciples there, and it became a very good place for ministry. Look at verse 2. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Now, we don't, Matthew doesn't give us a whole lot on this story. There's a lot more to this story. In fact, I'm going to read uh, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, gives us a whole lot more background in this story. But the picture basically here is Jesus is now in this house, and there's all kinds of people crowding and trying to push in to find out more about this Jesus guy, right? And listen what Mark says, chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. And again, he entered Caper Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near to him because the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies who can forgive sins but God alone? And so here's the scene. Try to imagine this now, if you will. You're hanging out, hanging out in this little house. Everybody's crowding in. You, you know, Jesus is teaching the Word Himself. He is the Word. He's preaching from the Old Testament. What an awesome Bible study this must have been. People are can't even see him. They're outside the door just listening, trying to hear what, what, he's, what he has to say, and somebody starts ripping the roof off the place. I mean, that's a pretty awesome little scene. It's probably this flat roof kind of a deal with this thatching or something like that, and they're pulling the thatching apart and just enough, big enough to, to let down this guy on his bed just, just so that Jesus would heal him. For one, I'll say that these four guys, man, the Lord must have blessed them because they, they, took, their, you know, they took the time out and they spent the energy to climb up on the roof of this place, carry this guy there, and then lower him down. They love this guy, and that's awesome. And, and they drop him down before Jesus, and he sees the faith not just of the paralytic, but the faith of the four men who brought him there. This guy, Jesus, we know he can heal. We know he can do this. But then here's the key, and this is always the key, as I pointed out in my introduction, it's, it's, it's not about the disease. It's not about the, the paralysis. It's not about, you know, the fever of, of, of Peter's mother-in-law. It's, it's not about, you know, we're going to see Jairus' daughter who lies dead, and Jesus heals him at the end of this chapter. It's not about that. It's about sin. You know, the Bible starts out with the first two chapters, Genesis 1 and 2, and there's no sin. And, and then you get to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, chapters 21 and 22, the last two chapters of the whole Bible, and there's no sin again. The whole story of, of the Bible is Jesus dealing with sin. God dealing, how is God going to put sin out of the picture? How, the, the whole relationship problem we have with God, what's between him and us is sin. It's sin. And Jesus makes it very clear here in saying, your sins are forgiven you, that he has the ability, the authority, and the power to remove, to release. As far as the east is from the west, the remission of, not the covering of, that was the old covenant. This is the new covenant now. Jesus removes the sin. Big difference here. Powerful thing. Isaiah said this about the Messiah in chapter 43, verses 24 through 25. You have burdened me, this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, with your sins. You've burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sin. I will not remember it. I can't even remember your sin. Isn't it funny how sometimes we constantly remind God of our sin? <laughs> He's like, what sin? I don't know what you're talking about. Jesus' blood covers that. I see you through my son. And we're, but what we do need help with is the, the ability to resist and reject the fleshly desires that we struggle with, right? In Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, it says this, And the Lord passed before him. You remember this. This is when Moses wanted to see the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, this is Moses speaking, The Lord, the Lord, God, 
merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, listen to this, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. You want to do a, a fun little study? Look up those three words. Go back to your Old Testament. Go back to Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Get yourself a Hebrew, uh, you know, helps book, something that can help you discern these words. You've got iniquity, transgression, and sin. Forgiving these three. God does these things. Moses knew it just by the seeing the image of his back pass by in the crevice of a rock. He goes on to say, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. You want to be on the prior side of that. Forgiving iniquity, transgressions, and sin, not on the latter. Jesus is the very one who has this power, this right and authority. It has been given to him by the Father as he sits now at the right hand of God. He's earned it. He's paid the price for it. And the very same way that you remember from chapter 9 of Genesis when Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Righteousness is obtained by grace through faith. And a lot of the tension that we see in this chapter has to do with legalism versus grace an Old Testament mentality relationship with God versus the New Covenant, New Testament that Jesus is bringing forward here. You see this expressed. As you're going to see this, the scribes enter in. And, and we've already seen them here in verses 2. And, and now we see them in verses 3, excuse me, where it says, and at once some of the scribes said within themselves, this man is a blasphemer. Why? Because they knew what their Old Testament Bibles taught, that God and God alone has the authority to forgive sin. Well, why not? Isn't he the one that said what is sin and what isn't? That's what the law is all about, right? This is wrong, this is right, this is bad, this is good, so on and so forth. 613 Mosaic laws. God laid them out for us, right? If he's the, the law giver, he's also the authority to forgive, is he not? He's the judge. And so, you know, that's what the scribes understood. And now they look at Jesus and say, he's a blasphemer because he forgives sins. But Jesus knew his thought, knew their thoughts. And here, now they should have known. They should have known Isaiah 43. They should have known Isaiah 34. All these passages, uh, Exodus 34, all these passages that I'm reading for you that reveal that both God and the Messiah that God would send had the right power and authority to forgive sins. They should have known this. They should have identified the miracles that Jesus was doing, doing, know him from these things, know him from his works, like Jesus said to Philip, and they should have received him as God. I wasn't there. Easy for me to sit back a Monday morning quarterback and pick on these guys, but I think they made a choice in their heart to believe what they wanted to believe. Because look at the comparison with these others who come humbly just saying, Lord, forgive me. Lord, heal me. And Jesus says this, this, is, this reveals what, where the problem is right here. Ready? Why do you think evil in your hearts? Why do you think evil in your hearts? You call me a blasphemer. Why are you thinking that? It's evil to think that. See, Jesus saw the faith of the men lowering the paralytic, and he saw the thoughts of the scribes. He sees all things, and he's, he knows our thoughts and our faith as well. Think of Psalm 139. David, David knew that. David said, you know, you search me, search me, know me, try my anxieties, see if there be any wicked way in me. Lord, you know my heart, you know my thoughts, you know from afar off, Lord, where can I go from your spirit? To some of us, that's terrifying. To others, it's a comfort, comforting thing. If you're in the camp that, that Jesus and God knowing your thoughts and your sins and your heart and all that stuff, if that's terrifying to you, you need to check, see whether or not you're truly saved. It shouldn't be terrifying. It should be a comforting thought. Jesus now reasoning with the scribes, he said, look, why, why are you thinking these evil thoughts in your hearts? And then he reasons this out with them. He says, listen, verse 5, he says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or say, arise and walk? Now think about the question from the perspective of the scribes. They considered themselves the authorities on the Old Testament, on the Mosaic law. We're the authorities. You're the new guy. They knew in their hearts that they themselves could not heal this paralytic. 
nor do they know anyone within their religious affiliations or circles who could as well. Yet here's this Jesus who's coming and healing people and also forgiving sins. He is usurping, if you will, their authority over the people. That's where their struggle is. Do we turn the authority that we have over these people over to this new guy? From the perspective of Jesus, however, neither of these things are hard to say or to do, except in the absence of faith. Nazareth, for example. And so Jesus says, But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and he departed to his house. Jesus said, You know what? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you? Or arise, take up your bed, and walk? Obviously, anyone can sit back and say, Your sins are forgiven you. Anyone can say that. But without any authority behind it, does it mean anything to you? No. But if, but if I say to you, but if, but if in the, the pharisaical mind, the legal, the scribe, these guys are thinking, this guy is paralyzed from birth. Many of them think it's directly because of either sins that he committed, or, or, his, or in this case, since he was paralyzed from birth, that his family committed, that he was being, you know, this, his, the crimes of his family, breaking the Mosaic law, that he's being punished for his sin. This is the way they thought. And so, you know, here, okay, the sin is the reason. So if I say, arise, take up your bed and walk, walk obviously I've, I've forgiven the sin in their minds. The difference is the four men carrying and the man laying on the bed shared one thing in common. They came in humility and brokenness combined together with faith in Jesus and who he was. The scribes and the Pharisees, they stood proud and skeptical, skeptical because of their unbelief. And even after seeing the miracles before their own eyes, they still could not receive Jesus as the Messiah. In fact, they even grew harder in their hearts toward him. And we see this in, even within Christianity and religious leaders today sometimes. Verse 8, when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. Notice that the multitudes, they saw, they knew there's no way they could come to any other conclusion except that the power to heal and to forgive, that, that, that clearly God's behind this, but they think that, they, that God has somehow empowered just a man. Now, in a sense, it's true. In a sense, it's true. But they're not mixing faith that this man could be God. They're not mixing that. And it's something even the disciples struggled with. But they're not mixing that. They just think, you know what? This God's given you know, this power to men. This idea of, of them marveling, this is the word, by the way, uh, the same word for which we get phobia. Uh, it's the word phobeo, phobeo in the Greek. It means to frighten. What are they afraid of? Remember, fear is the opposite of faith. They're not mixing faith with what they see. Instead, they're observing the natural realm, the power this man has over, the authority this man has over the natural realm and sickness and disease and sin and all these things, and they're choosing to define it in a way that satisfies them based on their presuppositions. I heard a pastor once throw this word out, epistemological presuppositions. I was like, huh? But then he explained it very well. It's basically when you've already decided what you believe the Bible says and everything then that you go on for the rest of your life, you're stuck with that description and definition. And you're, you pretty much make every new bit of information that comes in fit what you've already decided you believe. Listen, Christianity is supposed to be dynamic, not static. Your faith should always be what's defining you as it changes you. It's not something that you decide you are one day, and that's it. That part of your life is done. And I settled that. I'm a Christian. I even, you know, I go to church every Sunday. I, you know, I do, I, I, this is what I do as my service. I tithe. I do this, that, and the other thing. That, that's God. That's, that's all settled. Christianity is not like that. It's supposed to be this, this never-ending relationship with the Lord where he's constantly changing your thoughts about God and about Christianity and about you know, righteousness and holiness. And, and you know what? He's got a lot of work left to do on us. Yes, he's forgiven us our sin, past, present, and future, but he's not done preparing us for eternity. He still wants to change us some more. And, and we get so stuck in this thinking of, uh, we, we sort of just put things in compartments and boxes and, and put them away. And men especially love to do this. You know, the box thing. 
a box for this, a box for that, a box for your mother-in-law somewhere down the basement, right? But that's not the way it works. It's dynamic. It's always up and down and changing and moving around, and, 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 and we have to try to move with it. You get that? Where's God at work in your life? Are you seeing miracles happen? If not, maybe you've kind of put God in a box. Maybe God wants to challenge that. We see this word phobeo. Fear, there's an acceptable fear of God. When it's manifested itself in reverence, the way a child fears his father's retribution when he willfully disobeys or she willfully disobeys. That's a correct application of a different kind of a fear at a reverence. Verse 9. Jesus passed on from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office and said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now, understand this about the tax collector of that day. Excuse me one second here. Tax collectors, typically what the Romans would do is they would find, you know, a local, uh, if it's over the province of the Jews, you know, here in... Uh, in this region, he would find a Jewish man. So, you know, sort of, you know, they, uh, that's the guy collecting the taxes, and he's a Jew, so it should be easier for him than us to get, you know, the Romans taking it from them, and, you know, may, they won't take it out on us. They won't, you know, uh, the, the, we'll, we'll make their own collect from them, and, and that's kind of what they did. As a class of people, because they were put in their own class, it was very, there was a lot of prejudice against them because they were, in a sense, betraying them, their own people. And, and the reason for that was because they were given the right, the authority by the Roman government, to actually collect more money than what was necessary. And this was their pay. So let's say the tax was, you know, uh, uh, you know $5 every time you pass by. Well, maybe I'd get seven and keep two for myself. And typically what these people would do, because they, could do, they really were given a lot of leeway, is maybe they didn't like you, so they charged you eight. But they liked somebody else, so they charged them 550. You know? And so it was very, the way they practiced this, and I'm not saying Matthew specifically did that, but most of the tax collectors were like that. And it was, nothing about it was fair. And, and so, you know, here's Jesus. He comes along, Matthew. Uh, Matthew is a, t is, is a tax collector. He's hated He's hated by his own people, and, and Jesus says, follow me, follow me. Now, I'm thinking if you want to start a new religion, right, you want to try to gather the people that everybody else admires, right? Influence people who influence people. Get people in your circle, well, you know, let's get this big name guy, this big name brand, let's bring that person in. That, you know, let, let's, let's have this big show and bring in, you know, the mayor or the, or the, you know, the owners of the businesses or, you know, because it's, you know, this is going to be what really builds, that, that's really, that's the world's way. Jesus doesn't do that. And the, and the whole next part of this chapter, we really see Jesus and how he, you know, ministers to people and we see Listen to this, verse 10. Look at this. Let me stop talking. Let the word speak for itself. Now it happened. As Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Wow. Many tax collectors, not just Matthew, many of them, and many sinners. And see, these two people were put in the same class together, sinners and tax collectors. How are you going to win over the religious people when you're doing this? You're going to offend them. Because in the synagogues and where these people were, there was a different way that, that, that you entered into. You had, to get, you had to get yourself, and this is a problem. Listen, you guys, a lot of people deal with this today. You had to get yourself clean before you could come in. That's how it worked. You had to get your life in order. You know, at least get a certain amount of sin under control before you, were, you could come in and be a member of the synagogue. You know, they didn't just let anybody in those places. If you were, you know, you were steeped in sin, they didn't come alongside you, put their arm around you and say, Come on, let me help you. Come on, come to church with me. It wasn't like that. You were ostracized from the community. There was prejudice. Listen, how do you know you picked the right church? Look around and there's a bunch of sinners. Look around and there's a bunch of sinners. You know, if you were to write a book, How to Pick a Church, would page one say, look for the one with the most sinners? That's what church is for. What church would Jesus attend today? Obviously, right here, he's having intimate fellowship. He's sitting at a table eating with these people. Sinners, tax collectors. And I wonder sometimes if we do this ourselves in Christianity, if we make distinctions. And now, now, there's a distinction here we have to be careful of too because there, there, are, there are, are sinners who are sinners and know that they're doing wrong and, and, and they want out. 
They're looking for hope from somebody who's going who's to help them, like Jesus, you know? And, and, and so that's a different category. But there are those also who are willfully disobedient, who even after you beg and you plead and you try to love them and you show them, come to church, come on, there's a better way of living. You can be freed from all this. And they still say, no, 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 I want no part of your, your Jesus. The Pharisees saw it. They said to Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Well, because they have the best food, I guess, right? No, but it's because they were looking for something Jesus had. You see, the Pharisees, they didn't need Jesus. They were already righteous. Just ask them. They'll be glad to tell you all about it. How many times a month they fast? How many times a day they pray? They want to put their religiosity out there in the public so that you would admire them. Jesus will later say they have their reward, as he has before, in full. Do your deeds that are religious before men, you've got your reward. When Jesus heard them say it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, <clears throat> but those who are sick. You ever had somebody say to you, maybe you've shared, tried to share your faith with somebody. You ever had them say, oh, that's just a crutch. You know what they mean by that? You know, it's just what you lean on. It's just something, you know, it's like something to help you get through life. Just some system of faith or thought that sort of helps you cope with your reality, you know? And they're like, I don't need that. It's just a crutch. And, and this is the best response I've ever heard. And you can go ahead and, it's not mine, so you can rip it off too. I stole it. It's not a crutch. It's the whole hospital. I need more than a crutch. Crutch ain't enough for me because I'm a sinner. I'm sick. I'm in need of healing. Christianity is the answer. It's not a crutch. It's the whole hospital. Their way, again, get yourself cleaned up, deal with your sin, and then we'll associate with you. But Jesus here is, this should be coals of burning fire on their heads. They should feel so bad about this. And when they see this humble Jesus, Jesus came and he met them, the people, right where they were, went into their houses, Tax collectors, sinners, that includes, you know, hookers and, you know, all these just to, to despise, cast off people of the society where he went in and he met with them and he, he was pulling them out of their life. Get out of your sin, you know? Or, or if, if you're a tax collector, be honorable in your job. Honor God, you know? You can get your life right. Why? Look at verse 13. This is what he says to the Pharisees. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mercy, the Greek word for mercy is elios, elios. It's a word that I really got to know well because I needed an awful lot of it in my day. Still do. But grace and mercy, they're like kissing cousins. Grace, charis, unmerited favor, being given way more abundantly than we actually deserve or have earned. We can't even deserve it or earn it. We just, God gives. Mercy, God relieving from us the consequences of our sin. You see, you know, I often will say to people with, with, in counseling and such, they'll say to me, you know, but, but, but I deserve or I've earned this or whatever. I'll hand them my Bible and say, well, can you show me a verse that says what you've earned or what you deserved? You know, what God owes you? What does God owe you? Show me because I don't know, because I must have missed that part of the Bible. Maybe that's a, a book that's not, maybe it's uh, First Conclusions. You have First Conclusions in your Bible? I don't, I don't either. But, but see, God doesn't owe us anything. But we have this massive debt of sin that was paid by Jesus, but even the consequences of our sin, God sometimes relieves those things, doesn't he? That's mercy. And these guys don't get mercy. They don't understand it. They think by their many sacrifices, they earn favor with God. Do you think that way? Because that, th that thinking, it creeps naturally into our minds. Here's why. Human beings desperately want to feel as though they have some value or worth, right? Every one of us do that. And so, you know, whenever somebody is in, in a sense indebted to you because of what you bring to the table, there's this sense of value or worth. It's just the way it works. And so, so we think, okay, God has done this for me. Now I gotta do something for him, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this great thing for God and God needs me and God loves me. And you know, 
But you can't. You can't do anything to earn God's favor. You can't earn or deserve it. These guys, that's how they thought. They did reli religious works thinking that they were earning the favor of God. The, you can't. There's, it's impossible. It's just without, without faith, it is impossible to please God. They look to themselves for their own righteousness. Jesus is saying it doesn't work that way. You have to come humble and broken. Come to a hospital. Go and study what it means to be merciful. I didn't come to call those who think of themselves as already righteous, but instead I came so that those who know that they're sinners and desire to be forgiven, they would be given or granted repentance. God's compassion on the sinner. In fact, in Hosea 6, verse 6, it says this, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God the relational knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The disciples of John came to him, that is John the Baptist. You know what? Why don't we get into this next week? We're going to see next week the disciples of John the Baptist come. And this is a great question. Maybe you've wondered this too. Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? You notice that the three years that they really didn't, we're not told that they did a lot of fasting and, you know, weeping and praying and such. And and that's a legitimate question. When do we fast? Why do we fast? One of my favorite subjects is fasting. So I want you to fast all this week until next week. What? What? Oh, it's Calorie Chapel. I forgot. 